Chapter 6 The next couple of weeks were hectic. Paget became the center of attention for a number of classes who submitted platform ideas for the campaign, social media ads, and how to polish her image for the public. Paget was glad she had enlisted Mrs. Brown. The woman was a drill sergeant and seemed to know exactly how to proceed. Paget was consulted, but that was about it. She had a photo session with the art class, and the next thing she knew, there were posters all around campus telling people to vote for her. It was crazy. Adam, Sasha, and Mariah set up a booth, taking turns manning it and trying to educate students by handing out flyers. She suspected Adam was responsible for the sudden ads she saw of herself on Facebook. Total strangers were coming up, asking for selfies and wishing her luck against Mayor Johns. Mrs. Brown gave her a spot on air every single day for a half-hour show. Paget couldn't believe her luck. She was going to graduate with an amazing amount of practice. It was during one of the shows that she came up with an idea. I'd like to talk to you today about the homeless issue in our city. We all know Mayor Johns' plan to ship them away to other cities so that they aren't our problem anymore. That would be the easy thing to do. However, I happen to think that sometimes the easy way isn't the right way. Paget swallowed and put down her notes. She was going to say this from the heart. She leaned forward to the microphone. I happen to know a few homeless people. I've shared a sandwich and tea with Ed. Ed is an elderly man who lives in the Elm Park. He doesn't want to live there, but our local shelters only allow a man to stay for one month before they need to move on. Then they can return after another 30 days. The thing is, a lot of our shelters are full, so even if a man like Ed wanted to stay, there isn't always room. Ed didn't choose to become homeless. He had to sell his home, his car, everything he owned. He did it because his wife Colleen had cancer and he needed to pay for her treatments. He took care of her until she passed. They were married for 65 years. Ed is saving up his pension so that he can move away and find cheaper housing. He has no children to take care of him. However, someone from the community has been looking after Ed. Max is homeless too. I don't know his living situation exactly because he hasn't told me. Yet he has a job and he uses some of his earnings to help Ed and many others. He buys breakfast from a local cafe and distributes it to a number of people who live under the bridge near Edgemont. Max is a generous, kind man who takes care of so many others. Anyone who knows Max is very lucky. Paget swallowed the lump in her throat. I dated Max for a short time. When I found out he was homeless, I broke up with him. Not exactly because he was homeless. I hope I'm not that much of a snob. I broke up with him because I felt that he had lied to me. He hadn't been open to me about his situation. Being homeless has a stigma attached to it. Max doesn't have a mental illness. He's not an addict. He's just in a situation where he finds himself unable to afford a place to live. How many people have to choose between groceries, rent, or utilities every month? They juggle their finances until finally they can't juggle anymore. Yes, there are people who are in need of services, mental and physical health services, and they are on the streets. There are even some very scary people out there. Yet there is an amazing people like Max as well. Paget sighed. I can understand why he didn't want to tell me. When the common reaction is to just shove these people away, like what Mayor Johns wants to do, or just to ignore them, how could he expect that I would be okay with him living this lifestyle? I propose we try to find funding to help these people in any way possible. No one should have to live on the streets if they don't want to. I know that means we'll have to cut other programs or figure out a way to raise the funds. However, I don't feel it's right or fair to simply send these people away. They have names. They have stories. They are important, too. Paget could see Melanie grab a tissue and wipe her eyes. Paget gave her a watery smile. I know all our budgets are tight. Sometimes I don't know if I'm going to make my rent, too. But I would like for us, the students of this college, to come together and put on a dinner for the homeless people of this city. I'd like us to make and carry warm meals to the hundreds of people who don't always get them. I'd like us to talk to these people and understand that they are nice, they care, and they have hopes, too. I've put together a sign-up sheet and a donation sheet. If you can't give money or food that we can use, then please give your time. And Max, I know you're probably not listening, this being a college station, 
but I'm sorry, and I'd like a second chance if you'll give me one. Melanie came on the air. We'll be opening the phone lines for calls. If you have a question or would like to volunteer or donate to Paget's Feed and Talk to the Homeless campaign, please call. She put on a commercial and smiled at Paget. That was good. You're natural. Thanks, Paget said wryly. I just hope we don't get into trouble from the dean when he hears about this. Oh, I think Mrs. Brown can handle him, Melanie winked. Paget gave her a confused look. What do you mean? Rumor has it Mrs. Brown was spotted in the dean's office doing some extracurricular activities. I think she's looking to change her last name, Melanie grinned. His comb-over was a little must when she came out. No, Paget breathed. She couldn't believe it. Lydia and the dean? Really? Melanie nodded. Hey, we've got calls. Isn't that normal? Paget asked. Not really, Melanie laughed. Students tend to listen to other more popular mainstream stations. They took the calls and pledges. Patchett was really surprised and happy with the level of enthusiasm and participation that was happening from her simple speech. Then she saw Melanie get excited. The student producer made a motion for Paget to wrap it up quickly with her current caller. Paget did and gave Melanie a confused look. We have a caller on line five. Melanie spoke over the airwaves like it was any other caller, but she was practically dancing in her seat. Hello? Paget asked, hitting the button. This is Uni 5, Paget here. Hello, beautiful, said a familiar sexy voice. There was a hitch in Paget's voice as she replied, Hi, Max. I guess you were listening. I was. It took me ten minutes to get through, so I imagine a lot of people were listening. Sounds like your program is a success. It's been doing pretty good, thank you. Paget fiddled with her pen. Max, I want to say sorry for how I reacted when I found out about... About your housing situation. It was a bit of a shock, and I was upset. I felt like I had been lied to. My husband, Gary, he used to lie to me a lot, and I didn't want you to be lying to me. But you were right. You didn't lie, you just hadn't told me. I'd found out before you were ready to tell me, and I should trust that you would have told me when you felt ready. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Max said. I should have told you sooner. I promise I will never intentionally lie to you, Paget. You mean far too much to me. Paget smiled and wiped away a tear. Thank you. Does this mean I can walk you home from work again? Max asked hopefully. Paget gave a small laugh. Please. That's all the time we have for today, Melanie interrupted. Please sign up on our Facebook page. Paget listened as Melanie gave the details and her on-air light went out. Max, are you still there? I am. He seemed a little amused by the interruption. I missed you. Tell me what time you get off tonight, and you will miss me no more, he promised. Paget felt as nervous as if she was going on a first date again. She checked herself in the lady's mirror five times in the past hour. She was jumpy. She got three customer orders wrong. You're off the till, Dick said grimly. I don't know what is wrong with you, but you can go clean for the last half hour shift. Chastised, Paget grabbed a spray bottle and a cloth. Time was going so slowly. It felt like twenty minutes had passed, and yet when she looked at the clock, only a minute had ticked by. Does that clock need batteries? Dix looked at the clock, then at Paget. She was annoyed. Do you not see the cord? It's plugged in. Sorry, Paget muttered. She scrubbed a table. Butterflies were fluttering through her stomach. Dix gave her a funny look and helped a customer. Once she was finished, she came over to Paget, grabbing the cleaning cloth. You've been cleaning this table for the past five minutes. If you aren't going to be useful, you can go home, or you can tell me what is going on. Paget grinned. Max is coming to walk me home. Dix blinked. You made up with him? About time. Hey, I had valid reasons, Paget protested. Maybe, but it's not like guys like that grow on trees, Dix dimpled. This means maybe you'll be back to normal and not so mopey. Paget grabbed the cloth back. She rolled her eyes. Love you, too. You know you do, Dix said happily. Now, get this stuff done properly so we can get out of here on time, and you can go take your midnight walk with Prince and Popper Charming. Paget smiled back and found a new table to scrub. They rushed through the closing routine and were ready when Max showed up. He had a single red rose for Paget. 
What, nothing for me? Dix demanded. Max smiled down at Paget, and she shyly took the rose. Sorry, Dix, she sniffed. That's okay. I wouldn't want my boyfriend to get jealous. Max raised an eyebrow. You and Adam have moved to that stage in the relationship? Dix rolled her eyes. Like, you don't know, since you and he talk every single day. See you later, kids. Good night, Paget called after her. She took Max's arm, and they walked along in silence, enjoying each other's company. Paget enjoyed the feel of being on his arm again under the streetlights. They took a leisurely pace and eventually went through the park to her building. When they got to the entryway, Paget wasn't sure what to say. She fiddled with her keys. Paget, I want to thank you for giving me a second chance, Max said solemnly. If you don't mind, I'd like to tell you why I've chosen to live this way. I like that, Paget gave him a tentative smile. She invited him up to her apartment and they settled on the couch. Max held her hand, tracing her fingers with his free hand. I used to work for a large pharmaceutical company, Max sighed as he began his story. My job was to get drugs approved quickly by the FDA so they could help people. I believed in what we were doing. Then I found out that one of my drugs, one that I helped to get through the FDA tape a little quicker, had some serious side effects. My friend Dylan, his daughter Shannon, was on that drug and things had started to go seriously wrong. I have a bachelor's in science. I went through the clinical trials and found discrepancies. The drug helped to metabolize food so that patients would need less insulin. It also affected kidneys and livers, leaving irreversible damage. I brought the matter to the head of the company, and he ignored it. We weren't in the business of making people better. We were in the business of profiting from their illness. The company had a class lawsuit brought against it by the parents of numerous children that were impacted. Because the company had so many lawyers and money, it crushed the lawsuit. I couldn't bring forward the clinical results because the originals had been changed, and I couldn't prove otherwise. When I had confronted the head of the company, I foolishly left the documents that I had created about the discrepancies of the drug with him, because I trusted that he would do the right thing. I was wrong. After the trial, I talked to the defense team and set up a fund for all these kids to help for medical expenses, to help the families endure a problem that we created because all the children who took our drug have either died or are dying. I personally apologized to any family that wanted to meet with me. When the head of the company found out about the fund, he was furious. I had opened the company up to liability. He told me to dissolve the fund, and I refused. We were responsible. It was the least we could do. Max gave a joyless laugh. I was responsible. I had helped fast-track this drug. The owner and I argued, but I wouldn't back down. I was fired from my job, although they termed it better. I believe they said I left over personal reasons or some such thing. I was blacklisted from all other companies of the same distinction in a quiet, unofficial way. I sold everything I had, and I put it in that fund. Every penny that isn't for my basic survival, I give to the fund, and I've done it. All of those children's medical care has been covered except one. Shannon isn't covered because Dylan won't let me, but he understands what I'm trying to do. Now there are only two survivors left, Shannon and a boy named Rubio. Rubio is a fighter, but he's the last stages and it won't be long now. I'm just trying to do the right thing. The hospital bills are huge. I've sold everything I own to put money towards them. I've fundraised. I've begged old friends. I can't justify using money on an apartment to make myself more comfortable when some of the parents couldn't pay the hospital bills or they themselves would have been homeless. I know it's hard to understand, but this is something I just had to do. I feel responsible and I'm doing my best to help them. I work for a demolition company. I'm not in labor so much anymore. When the boss found out I was good for getting permits and organizing things, he made me a manager. He's ready to retire, and I've been working toward taking over the company. It's how I've managed to keep paying the last of the hospital bills for the past five years. Once I settle Rubio's bills, it will be over. Then I can work on starting over financially. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. Oh, Max... Paget didn't know what to say. It put a whole different light on his situation. 
she felt badly for how she had reacted. Can you forgive me, Paget? There's nothing to forgive. She hugged him tightly. Isn't there something that could be done to make the drug company pay? I know you feel responsible, but you shouldn't have to shoulder this burden alone. They are very powerful. No one wants to go up against that company. Max sighed and savored the feeling of holding on to her. He pressed a kiss into her hair. I'm not shouldering the burden alone. I'm sharing it now, with you. I'm glad that you are, Paget leaned against him. Is there any way I can help? You said you fundraise. I know some people who might be able to contribute to your fund. I think I'm at the point where to fundraise might mean getting too many contributions. Then I wouldn't know what to do with the extra money. Max shrugged. It's just Rubio, and then I'll be done. I think in less than a year I can start putting money towards my future. Basically, you're as broke as I am. Paget drew circles on his shoulder with her finger. Yep, he agreed. Financially, sure. But I think we're rich in a different way. Paget looked up at him. How's that? We have each other. Paget smiled. She was very glad that she had forgiven him. You're sleeping on the couch tonight. Why? Because I'm not going to worry that you're somewhere out there, sleeping on the street, waiting to get murdered by some thug, Paget said seriously. Max laughed. You sound like my brother Noah. Well, maybe Noah has a point, Paget poked him in the chest. If you don't, I'm not going to be able to sleep for worrying about you. Being on the streets isn't great. However, it's not as unsafe as all these crime shows and nightly news make it out to be. Plus, I'm not actually sleeping on the sidewalk right now, Max said. Right now? You mean that you have? Paget questioned with some alarm. Hey, it's okay. I'm either in the company truck or at the men's shelter, depending how crowded it is. He gently pushed a strand of hair behind her ear. Would you like to see the shelter? It's not that bad. Not that bad, Paget murmured. Compared to what? Max smiled. Come and see. You'll understand that there is no need to worry. Fine. Tomorrow, Paget decided to go and see the place. But tonight, you're staying on the couch so I can sleep in peace. Okay, Max agreed. I can do that. Just for you. Good. Paget leaned her head on him again, closing her eyes. That makes me happy. Well, Max's voice rumbled in her ear. Anything to make my girl happy. After Max cooked her breakfast in the morning, they went to see the local men's shelter where he had been staying. It was run by a group of volunteers with some funding from the city and a few church groups. Paget was pleasantly surprised to find it clean, despite the run-down old building that it was housed in. Cots lined different rooms for people to sleep in. There were eighty beds, which the staff confided weren't really enough for this part of town. There was a cafeteria where three meals were served each day. There were washrooms and showers. It was painted a depressing hospital green. Everything was old. The cots, the tables, the chairs. But it was clean, and while some of the inhabitants looked a little shady, they all seemed to brighten up when they saw Max. He knew so many of them by name. He knew their stories. Max introduced her, and they spent the better part of an hour greeting people and asking how they were. It made Paget both proud of Max and sad that these people had fallen on such hard times. She found out that the shelter was always in need of donations, and decided that while Max might not have need of her fundraising skills, these people certainly did. She would make a few inquiries today from her old acquaintances to see if she could help some of the shelters around the city. It would be her surprise gift to Max. Finally, Max needed to get to work, and she had classes so he left her at the bus stop to catch the bus to campus. As she rode the bus, Paget realized that she had a voicemail from her mother. She wondered what her mother could possibly want, and listened as Judith Forrester announced that she was going to drop in on Paget later that afternoon. She was going to inspect Paget's apartment, and then perhaps they could catch dinner. She announced a time, and then hung up. Paget stared at her phone. In the entire year that she had been living in the Elm Street apartments, her mother had never once indicated any interest in seeing where she lived. There was probably some material motive involved, but Paget couldn't think of what it might be. Well, she wouldn't have to wait very long, she reflected. It was a good thing that she wasn't scheduled to work at the cafe later today. 
If she had been, she would have had to reschedule with her mother, and Paget knew the hard way that Judith liked things on her timetable. In class, Paget found herself doodling Max's name again. She really had to find out his last name. Sighing, she pulled herself out of her schoolgirl crush and concentrated. Adam found her in the hall and grinned happily. "'I heard from a little birdie last night that the two of you patched things up,' he practically jiggled for joy. Paget shook her head, but she smiled. "'What can I say? I'm a sucker for him.' "'I still want an invite to the wedding,' Adam called as he headed down the hall to get to class. "'We're not that far yet,' Paget yelled happily back. Paget made sure to catch the early bus back after classes. She frantically cleaned the apartment until everything was hidden and what was visible was shining. Her mother wouldn't look in the oven anyways, so that was where most of the mess went. And since Paget rarely cooked using the oven, she felt pretty safe about using it as a storage compartment in emergencies such as this. She knew her mother would look down her nose at the place. While it was run down and tired, it didn't mean that it couldn't be clean. Paget wondered if she should have called her mother to ask why the visit. She might have saved herself and her mother the aggravation of the inspection and disdain. Judith Forrester did not frequent this neighborhood, nor would she normally deign to do so. It simply wasn't in a neighborhood that was acceptable to a person of her social standing. So it was with some surprise and suspicion that Paget went to meet her at the entrance of the park. She came out of a couple of minutes early to make sure that she was there when the car arrived. It didn't do to be late when it came to her mother. The black town car was there, perfectly on time. The driver opened the back door and helped Judith out. She looked around with disdain, and Paget took a bracing breath before doing the customary greetings and air-kissing of both cheeks. "'I don't know how you can live here,' her mother said, looking around as they walked through the park. "'It's filthy, and it's not safe.' It was true that there was a little bit of garbage on the ground. Things were tired and worn-looking. There was a piece of cardboard in a broken window that hadn't been fixed the entire time Paget had been there. The lighting was spotty at best at night. The park itself was a little overgrown and not well maintained. Yet in the months that Paget had lived here, it had become home. Besides, it was all she could afford, which really meant that she couldn't afford it at all. But it was better than the slums. Paget was just about to protest her mother's opinion when suddenly her mother gasped and pointed into the park. "'Is that a homeless man?' her voice dripped with disdain. Paget didn't know what came over her. She just couldn't help herself. Paget followed her mother's pointing finger to see that she was pointing at Max. That's when Paget got really angry and she didn't know why. Her mother was right. He was homeless. That was an indisputable fact. He was there, ripped jeans, a couple of holes in his black tee, hair a little long, talking to old Head, who sat on the bench. Paget just didn't like the way her mother had said it, so judging, about such a nice, smart, charming man. A man who bothered to talk to old Ed when so few did. A man who made sure that other people were taken care of. A man who walked Paget home on dark nights through the half-lit park. Her mother didn't know him. How dare she look down on him? Biting her bottom lip, Paget marched across the brown sparse grass, hooked her arm through his, and walked a startled Max straight back to her ever-immaculate mother, who stared in a horrified fascination that Paget would bring this specimen of human failure to her. Max, this is my mother, Judith Forrester. Mom, this is Max, Paget smiled brilliantly. He's coming with me to Trisha's wedding. Her mother simply looked at Paget non-pulsed. Max held out a hand. How do you do? Quite well, I'm sure. She looked down at the dirty calloused hand proffered to her and simply chose to ignore it. Darling, could I speak with you a moment? Paget continued, smiling determinedly. Max and I met in a college bar on 5th. He's been simply wonderful. I've never had to worry about my security at night because Max has been so kind as to walk me home. Isn't it fortunate that he lives so close to my building? It's true. I take Paget's safety very seriously. Max gave her a slightly odd look, but decided to play along, smiling for her mother's benefit. How nice. Paget's mother smiled tightly. What do you do, Max? Right now I'm working with the demolition cleanup crew. 
There's an old building near the docks that has been torn down, and we're just clearing away the debris before they start construction on the site. If you know anyone who could use the work, it's cash daily and will be steady for the next couple of weeks. I'll be sure to pass that along. She sniffed. Her tone said otherwise. Her look told Paget that he was beneath her. Paget, you can stop this joke now. The smile faded from Paget's face. What joke? This farce. This rebellion of yours. Your father and I have been giving it some thought. We've decided to invest in a condominium, which is why I wanted to talk to you today. You could be our first tenant, just until you get your feet again. Her mother adjusted her purse strap. Mrs. Milton says Earl's lost a little bit on that new Cato diet fad. I'm sure if you fix yourself up a bit, you could convince him to take a second look at you. Earl Milton. Paget couldn't believe her. Why, yes, she smiled happily. Betty says he's finally ready to settle down. If anything, it would be Paget doing the settling. Her teeth ground together and her chest got a little tight. Max cleared his throat and wrapped an arm around Paget's waist. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Forrester, but Paget isn't available for Earl. Pardon me? She arched an eyebrow. Isn't that right, honey? Max kissed Paget on the forehead and grinned down at her. In for a petty, in for a pound, Paget thought and smiled back, wrapping her arms around her. I was thinking I could take Max over for Sunday dinner, if that works for you. To meet Dad. Paget, Emily, her mother huffed. Stop this nonsense. Sunday doesn't work, Paget innocently said. That's too bad. I guess we'll just see you at the wedding. We're meeting with the realtor on Tuesday. I'll send the car for you. Her mother began picking her way back to the gate of the park, where the town car driver patiently waited for her. I like her. She doesn't like me, but I like her, Max looked down at Paget. She groaned. I am so sorry, Max. I don't know why I did that. I should be used to the fact that she's not going to accept my life, and goading her doesn't help. Hey, I haven't been to a wedding for a while. It'll be nice, Max touched a finger to Paget's forehead. I can see where you get that little furrow from when you aren't happy. Your mom has that, too. Paget swatted away his finger. You don't have to go. I was just... Honestly, I don't know what I was doing. Who's Earl Milton? Max cocked an eyebrow. Should I be jealous? A snort erupted from Paget before she could stop it. Anyone actually jealous of Earl? She doubted it. She tried to explain. He's a nice guy. He is... He's just... Just what? He's nice. He's like a family pet. A little overweight, a little overeager. Once in a while you throw him a bone. He's nice to have around, but mostly he's just ignored. Paget shrugged. He's nice. And I feel bad about how I just described him, but it's true. Your mom seems to think he's a good catch, Max pointed out. My mother is blinded by a person's social status and balance sheet. Paget rolled her eyes. Plus, she's friends with Earl's mother. So, are you going to go out with this Earl guy? He asked a little too casually. No. Why are you asking this? Paget was surprised he kept pursuing this. You can't be jealous of him. No, I'm not jealous of a guy I've never met. Max shrugged a shoulder. Maybe for the first time in a while, I was just thinking that it might be nice to be solvent. To be able to introduce myself to your parents and not see your mom wince. To keep you exclusively to myself. Max, Paget tried to say it gently. My mother is a snob. She always will be. It doesn't matter. I know I'm not much of a catch, but I'm working on it. I'm employed. I'm working on bettering my situation. I'm not a creep or crazy. The back of Max's hand pressed tightly against Paget's cheek. It's not easy dating in my situation. I haven't actually asked anyone out in a long time, but I think you're pretty amazing. I think you're pretty amazing too, Paget said. She wondered what he meant exactly about exclusivity. She liked that idea. And I understand that things are hard financially. They're hard for me as well. What would you say if in a year or two I did ask you to marry me? Max wondered. He watched her intently. What would you say to your parents? Suddenly, it was hard for Paget to breathe. He really was serious here. 
Padre didn't know what to say. He was homeless, said her mother's voice in her head, and Padgett wondered, was she as much of a snob as her mother? No one knows what's going to happen in a year or two. He closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against hers. I was thinking, he said softly, maybe in a year or two I might have my life back together. I might be able to help you with the bills so you're not always so worried. I would be able to cheer for you when you graduated, with honors, because I know you're smart. I might wake up next to you each morning, which would make my day. It's too soon, Paget blurted out, a little panicked. She didn't know what she was thinking, if she even was thinking. Part of her was afraid of making a mistake again, getting involved with a man who might hurt her like her husband Gary had. Part of her wanted very much to find out what being with Max would be like. Waking up next to him every day? The thought was both thrilling and scary. I can wait, Max said, stroking her hair. I'm very patient. We can take all the time you want to get to know each other. I just want to put it on the table that I'm looking at a future with both of us in it. It's not that. It's... Paget scrambled to say something, anything that might not hurt his feelings, but give her time to examine her own. I have only been a widow for a year. Of course. Max took both of her hands in his. I entirely respect that. You must have loved him very much, and I... Paget snorted. She couldn't help it. She briefly closed her eyes, embarrassed. I'm not sure that I did. Well, I did at some point, but not at the end. Gary and I... It was complicated. The thing is, I don't trust my judgment with men. Then we'll take it slow. Snail pace slow, and you'll find that you can place your trust with me. Max lifted her hands and placed a kiss on each of them. We have all the time in the world. I know I'm ahead of you thinking all this. Patchett's hands reached up to cradle his face. She didn't want to disappoint him, but she needed to be truthful, too. You are ahead of me, Max. I'm not sure what the future holds. I do know that I have a few hours free tonight, and I do okay at making spaghetti if you'd like to come to dinner. Max smiled. I'd like that. Good. I'm sorry I dragged you into all this. I put you on the spot, and that wasn't fair. She was just... She was looking down her nose at everything. The neighborhood, where I work, what I'm trying to achieve, and then she looked at you and Ed. She just made some remarks, and I couldn't let it go. Max raised an eyebrow and said dryly, So you held me up under her nose like a muddy frog? No, Paget looped her arm through his and steered him toward the street. She needed groceries if she was going to make dinner tonight, and he didn't seem to mind her dragging him along. Okay, maybe just a little like holding up a frog? She was really making me so mad. I don't know why I still want her approval. I'm an adult. I should be fine with what I want. All kids want their parents to accept them in their choices, Max said quietly. Sometimes we have to accept that's not going to happen. I shouldn't have done it, Madgett apologized. I'm sorry. Where are we going? Max asked. I need a few things for the spaghetti. I like to add to the sauce so it tastes better. There's a market right around the corner, Paget explained. It was her go-to place for groceries since it was so close and she was always walking. Nothing sucked more than having a bag break or carrying something heavy over a long distance. I have to ask, do you actually want me to be your plus one for the wedding, or was it just to goad your mom and you'd rather I didn't? Paget was a little surprised by his insecurity. Usually he was Mr. Confident. I want you to be there. She realized that she did want him to be there. It felt right to bring him to meet her family. Her mother wouldn't like it. But it was past time Paget stopped seeking her for approval. Good. Max dropped a kiss on the top of her head. Besides, you need someone to buffer you from this Earl guy. Paget laughed. When you meet him, you'll understand he's absolutely no threat. As they entered the little corner store, a woman stopped them and asked for a selfie with Paget. Max was amused. Does this happen often? Are you suddenly famous and didn't tell me? Paget sighed. It's this campaign for the mayoral race. Adam came up with this brilliant idea of anyone who supports me to take a selfie with me and post it to their social media accounts to tell their friends. I'm getting stopped all the time now. That's a good thing, right? Max helped her to get his jar of spaghetti sauce off the top shelf. It means a lot of people are supporting you. 
True. However, I was almost late for class the other day. Paget grabbed some noodles. She wasn't sure just how many she had at home. Then there's all the paperwork and trying to memorize things for the debates. It's like I've added another class to my schedule, which is already full. Max turned her to face him and put his hands on her shoulders. Hey, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. I'm worried that I'm not going to be a good mayor, Paget said softly. I don't know half of what a mayor does. If I actually win, will I be so busy that I have to give up college? You're not going to give up on your dream, Paget. I won't let you, Max hugged her. Why are you doing this if it's not what you want? I don't want him to win. He's despicable. He doesn't care about the people in this city. He wants to ship off the homeless and make them someone else's problem rather than helping them. She leaned into Max, enjoying his comforting presence. He couldn't even pronounce my name right. Max chuckled. That is definitely a crime. I know. Paget sighed. I don't want him to win, and I'm the only one who has stepped up so far to stop him. When does the application process close? Next week? First debate is this week, Paget groaned. I'm not ready. I don't like talking in front of people. Max chuckled. You talk every day to people on the radio. It's different. I can't actually see them, she complained. I'm going to freeze up there. I just know it. Maybe you could get a bunch of students at the college to set up a mock debate for you to practice with, Mask suggested, so that you feel more comfortable with the real thing. Paget looked up to him. Do you think the college would let me? I think. What did you call your teacher? Lydia? At Paget's nod, Max continued. I think you are her favorite student, and she will definitely help you out with a mock debate. That's a really good idea, Paget molded over. If Mrs. Brown was willing, then it would help her to have the practice. Now, let's get whatever else you need for the spaghetti. Then we'll go back to your apartment and make up all sorts of cue cards for you to study from so that you feel better about these debates. Really? Paget asked, thankful that Max would do this for her. He smiled at her. What are study buddies for? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of The Reverse Cinderella, book two of the Ramsey Brothers series. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.